We are in the third week of a three weeks or four week sermon series titled Terrifying Moments. And we started off this sermon series talking about David and Nathan and the unwanted moments of facing our mistakes. Then last week we talked about these moments of anxiety and depression. We even talked a little bit about suicidal things. This week we are switching to another challenging topic, this concept, this idea of suffering. It's terrifying at times to think about suffering. It's a challenging and humbling topic. There is not much about suffering that we understand. We don't have an answer for some of the things that happen in our world. And we will see as we study this this morning that it affects those of us who are with God as much as those who are without Him. Wednesday was the four-year anniversary of Amy and I arriving here at Brady Lane Church. And yeah. we are so grateful and so uh, excited to see where God is going to take us as we move on forward. But as I was thinking about writing the sermon this week, I thought about all the times I have walked alongside some of you in your moments of suffering. From battling illnesses, to family problems, to loved ones passing away, from crises of faith... I know many folks in this room have suffered in many ways. And to those of you who I don't know yet, I'm sure you have suffered as well. Before we can go into the heart of our passage for today, I think we need to examine another scripture. This one from Isaiah 55, 9. And this is actually God speaking to Isaiah when Isaiah writes, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. I think it's appropriate, appropriate for us to start with that verse, especially, again, when we think about our own humanity. In our humanity, we who are finite, meaning we are, have a beginning and an end, we who are finite are trying to wrap our minds around infinite nature of God something that's beyond our grasp, grasp, something that's beyond our understanding. I want to throw a slide up on the screen as an illustration this morning. Can I illustrate it this way? Can you think of a time when maybe you were younger and you would go out and look up at the sky, look at the stars, and maybe you would try to, in the best way you could, count how many stars were in the sky. And after a, about 10, 15 minutes of that, you realized it was impossible, especially if you could see a sky like that. I know in Indiana, our, our skies are so light polluted that we can't really see the sky like that. But there's places in our country, there's places in the world where you can see how vast and how infinite the galaxies around us are, the stars, and how it keeps continuing to spread. They're just limitless. We can't wrap our mind around the number of stars that there actually are. They are infinite because they are part of what God is creating. When we think about suffering in relation to God, we have to remember that God is an infinite person. He's an infinite being. We can't begin to understand the big picture of creation like He does or the full extent of sin and its consequences, like He does, or the sacrifice that He made for us for redemption, like He does. So number one this morning, I want to start off with us admitting our limits. We need to admit that we have a limited understanding of God, and then that's okay. I want us to have some humility as we approach God, when we approach His throne and this topic. We aren't putting God on the witness stand today to have Him defend Himself. Rather, we are kneeling in worship before Him, asking Him for some wisdom on this topic. Uh, kneeling before Him, asking Him for some help to understand suffering. And secondly, I want to also teach with great compassion. This is not an easy topic for our world to understand. The number one thought, doubt, and concern on the minds of people, both inside and outside of the church, is this topic of suffering. Why does it happen? A national survey asked this question, if there was one thing that you could ask God, what would it be? And the number one answer to that question was, why is there suffering in the world? Why do we have to suffer? We don't have to look very far to see it, do we? Local tragedies. Just recently, about a month and a half ago or so, there was a local farmer just south of us here that was killed in a farming accident. 
people in our own congregation who are battling cancer, people in our own congregation who have recently lost children, siblings, parents, people in our own congregation who are suffering with being a widow or widower. So many stories from just our own flock. Can we be compassionate enough to come around the people outside of the church and say to them, we get it. We get it. We understand how challenging and personal this topic is in relation to God. And before we try to give them an answer, before we try to give them those Christian cliches of God's got this under control and, and, and God's got a plan, there's a purpose, God's going to make something good out of it, and, and I believe all those things, truly, I do believe those things, but before we start spouting off our Christianese, could we put an arm around their shoulder? Could we take a moment to listen to them? Can we offer to pray? with them before we give them an answer. Understanding and accepting suffering in our worldview is a challenge. To think that there is a God that loves us so much that He's willing to sacrifice His Son to save us, but at the same time, He's a God who is allowing Satan to have dominion over this world. To do whatever Satan wants to do to distract us, to delay us, to keep us from following God to cause us to suffer, to have hardship and pain. Man, this is a topic, this is something we have to wrestle with. Amen? The thing is, all worldviews, all belief systems have to handle this question. Why does suffering exist? And what can we do about it? And what I want to show you today are some texts from God's Word that maybe will help us understand suffering a little more. It doesn't make the suffering less painful. <laughs> it doesn't take it away. But I hope that it will bring some of God's light to the subject to help us leave here today a little less terrified of the suffering that's temporary that we have to go through on this earth. Turn your Bibles to Job chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the pew in front of you. So I encourage you to grab one of those today. As you are turning there, let me tell you a little bit about Job. Job is in the merry old land of Uz. <laughs> Not Oz, but Uz. Uh, in the land of Uz, there lived a man named Job. The text starts out saying, the man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, ten children. What a blessing. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. That's a lot of donkeys. I don't know what you do with all those donkeys, but there's a lot of donkeys. He also had a large number of servants, people who loved him and worked for him and served him. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East, the beginning of the text tells us. Then we're going to pick up what happens next to Job. There's a little introduction of him. We're going to look at verse 6, starting in verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming around through the earth, going back and forth on it. Now, since I gave you a little bit of an introduction to Job, it's probably appropriate for us to talk a little bit about who Satan is. Besides the red guy with horns, right? Satan is originally an angel of God who became corrupt and through his own pride fell. He has been evil since his rebellion against God. We find that in 1 John 3, 8. Satan considers God his enemy, tries to hinder God's work in people, but he's limited by God's power and can only do what he is permitted to do. Satan, unlike God, can only be in one place at a time, though he does have assistance of demons who are other fallen angels who fell with him. But as a created being, they are limited. We see that in Luke 22, 31 through 32. Satan is called the enemy because he actively looks for people to attack with temptation. We see that in 1 Peter 5, 8. He wants to make people hate God. And he does this through lies and deception. Any person 
committed to God should expect Satan to attack. Because Satan hates God, he also hates you. Let that sink in for a moment. We also learn from this text today that Satan is accountable to God. So let's see what happens next, starting in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch your hand out and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians came and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Whew. Sometimes reading the text wears you out. Job experienced great loss, but he responded in an unexpected way. There seems to be always in every good movie I've ever watched at least one great line that comes from the movie that makes you think a little differently or inspires you or makes you laugh or makes you think a little bit. For instance, in the Spider-Man movies, Uncle Ben is famous for saying, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Clint Eastwood from the outlaw Josie Wales. Are you going to pull those pistols or whistle Dixie? <laughs> That's as good as I can do. <laughs> or from the Hunger Games. May the odds ever be in your favor. Right? Things that we think about. And I thought this week, if, if there was ever to be a movie about Job... I would definitely make sure that this poignant moment was spoken aloud with Job with this swell of music as each person came to talk to him, to tell him the next calamity had just happened and then the next one and the next one. And the music keeps swelling and all of a sudden Job rips his clothes, shaves his head, and then at the peak of the scene he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wouldn't that be powerful to see that happen? Think about Job's losses. Let's look at his losses for a minute. He lost his possessions, everything he owned. Back in Bible times, animals were money, right? That was a huge amount of money that all went away all at once. All of his livestock, all of his camels, all of his donkeys, whatever they were for, all of these animals are gone. All of his servants, people that I'm sure he cared about, even though they workers, they were employees of his, they were servants. All of those people, gone, except for a few that got away to share the message. And then the worst possible news. Job, all ten of your kids are dead. He lost his family. Every earthly person and thing that mattered to him vanished in one day. Gone. 
But even with the losses, we see that Job responded righteously. He passed the test and he praised God, didn't he? He praised God. And though we see Job pass the test, it did not indicate that he escaped the extreme pain and suffering, did he? He didn't escape the grief that came with the losses. It says in verse 20 that he tore his robe and shaved his head to express his grief. And boy, so badly this week, I wanted to figure out a way to rip my clothes and shave my head in front of you on stage as an illustration. <laughs> but nobody needs to see that. <laughs> But he did. He expressed he had these outward, visible, audible expressions of grief before God. And I think we can take from Job here that these expressions of grief, whether they're big or small, are part of our process of honoring God. That we honor God when we grieve. Do you hear that this morning? It's okay to grieve. God doesn't expect Job to smile and go, Okay, thanks for a great day, God. Well, that was awesome. I sure enjoyed all of that. God expects us to come before Him in our pain and in our suffering and grieve when we lose. Job expresses his grief by tearing his robe and shaving his head. And Job, we see that we can approach God with visible, outward, expressive, emotional signs of grief. And it's okay. And we know it's okay because in the very last verse of this section, it says, In everything Job did to respond, he did not sin. So everything that he did was appropriate. Everything he did was good. I want to even venture out to say this morning that it's good for us to grieve. It's good for us to mourn. Big boys and big girls do cry. And it's all right. We've been talking about this in our grief recovery class. We're going to be having another grief recovery in the spring and another one next fall. And I encourage any of you who are struggling with grief, come and, come and join us for one of these classes. But the main point of the class that we've had so far is that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to mourn. We're supposed to. It's part of what we do with God. It's how we approach Him. Grieving before God in front of each other is not only okay, it's good for us. So what does this torn robe symbolize? The tearing of the robe, the tearing of one's clothes in the ancient tradition among the Jews is that it's associated with mourning and grief and loss. The first mention of someone ripping their clothes like this, ripping their garments, is in Genesis. When Reuben comes to the cistern to see if uh, 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 Joseph, thank you, Joseph is still in the cistern, right? And he's not there. And what's he do? Rips his clothes, right? And we see it again when Jacob finds out that his son Joseph is dead. He thinks he's dead. And he does the same thing. He tears his robe. We see it again uh, in other biblical examples. When David finds out that Jonathan and Saul had been killed in battle, he rips his robes out of grief. We see it also in Elisha, when Elijah is carried up in the chariot up into heaven. We see it again when Mordecai finds out that Haman has an evil plot to destroy the Jews. He rips his robes. We see it again when Ahab finds out from Elijah that he's got judgment coming against him. We see it when Paul and Barnabas think that the people of Lystra are beginning to worship them instead of God. And out of grief, they rip their robes. Sometimes the tearing of one's robes is also accompanied by other signs of humility and grief, such as shaving one's head, throwing dust or ashes upon oneself, wearing sackcloth. The main point of me telling all of this to you, and the point that's in your bulletin is, losses will come and God allows us to grieve. God allows us to come to Him with questions. God allows us to come to Him with anger. God allows us to come to Him with hurt and pain and tears. But Satan doesn't stop here, does he? If we're to read on in chapter 2, which we're going to do, chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord says to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan, I think Satan was a smart aleck, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in. It gives him the same answer, doesn't he? 
Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will have all a man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Well, very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And his wife came to him and said, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Nice. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in anything that he said. In Satan's second attack, he gets to take direct shots at Job. He attacks him physically, causes him to have all kinds of health issues, these boil things that pop up all over his feet, his head. And I, anybody had, have, has anybody here had shingles? Yeah, okay. Think about having shingles everywhere. That kind of thing. Or if you've had some type of boil in your life. Boils are not fun, they hurt. I'm getting gross here, aren't I? But these are things that he's afflicted with. He's got sores all over him, and he, and he can't find relief to the point where he's scraping those sores with a piece of pottery to get relief from them. And then he lost the respect of his wife in verse 9. Why don't you just die already, she says. Why don't you just die? And we joke about her, and we kind of snicker at her a little bit when she says that, but she's going through a process of grief herself, right? She's lost her ten children, too. <laughs> and she's looking at him. He's covered in sores. He might die, too, and she's maybe thinking to herself, I'm going to be left all alone. So she responds a little bit out of her own frustration and grief. But again, in the midst of all this suffering, Job responded righteously. He passed the test and he praised God. If we were to read on in Job, he has these friends who come to him uh, one morning and they, 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 they spend some time mourning with him at first. But then they basically start blaming him for his predicament. Surely you've sinned in some way to have been afflicted by God like this. What's your sin, Job? Confess your sin and you'll be healed. Job's like, I didn't sin. I don't know why this is happening to me. And then he has this other guy named Elihu that stops by and he shares, oh, God's just teaching you a lesson. He's disciplining you for something. And then we have Satan's point of view of suffering, that people only believe in God when things are going well. So if you make them suffer, they'll curse you to your face, God, Satan says. But God's view of suffering is simply this, and it's our main point this morning. We're not done, so don't put your stuff away. Our main point this morning is suffering causes us to trust God for who he is, not what he does or doesn't do. We trust him because he is who he is. The first and the last, the alpha and the omega. Not because of what he does. Jump ahead to the New Testament for a moment with me. The man, may, man by the name of Paul. You might have heard of him. Paul was a guy who knew suffering, shipwrecked more than once, imprisoned unjustly more than once, whipped and beaten more than once because of his faith. From those experiences, he's left permanent and lingering illnesses and injuries. Paul knew earthly suffering. Yet he had an attitude towards suffering that I think we need to understand. He boasted in his suffering. He embraced it because he knew his suffering brought him closer to God. 
2 Corinthians 12, 9, he writes this, and this is God speaking to his heart. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, this is Paul speaking now, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Yes. This question of God allowing suffering is difficult to accept. But he does allow it. He has given Satan dominion over this world for now. And the real hard truth answer is, God doesn't have to defend himself to us. He's God. We're not. But the one thing I do know about God, God understands suffering. He sent Jesus, his one and only son, and watched us kill him with our sin. God, even in his perfection, has suffered throughout time deeply, loving a people who have constantly turned their backs on him. God knows what it means to suffer. For we have broken his heart more than once. He tests us all to this day. You see, we have a choice. Choose God and someday be just like Job. We get to escape this world, this fallen world, and all the junk that's in it. We get to go be with God. We get to be with Him in eternity and perfection. Or we can choose to follow the world and all that's in it and therefore give up that opportunity. That's the choice. That's the good news that we have in all this brokenness and suffering that we face in this world is that we continue to have a choice. Amen. We get to choose. God doesn't determine. God's not an evil bully sitting up in heaven saying, well, not that person. Okay, this one can come. Not that person. Okay. God is not like that. God says all of you, all of the inhabitants of the earth, you have a choice. Choose me and be restored. Don't and be destroyed. Plain and simple. As I work through the sermon this morning, I get here about 6.30, quarter of 7 every Sunday, and I come in here and I work through my sermon a little bit out loud. And as I was working through it, I got to this point in my sermon and I had a whole different illustration written in. And I read through that illustration. I was like, I don't like that. There's, some, there's something else I like better. And I went upstairs this morning and I rewrote the ending. I don't usually do that. Sometimes I do it on Saturday. I'll catch it on Saturday. God hits me with something. But it was this morning. And I couldn't help but think of one of our own who has had his own suffering experience that would have taken most of us out. I had the privilege and honor of getting to attend the physical therapy session for Ken Rains, who's a member of our first service on Friday afternoon. He fell and broke his hip last Saturday night. Had surgery Sunday afternoon. And on Friday afternoon, he was doing therapy at the rehab place where he's at. Many of you may know Ken's story. Some of you don't know it. But basically, this guy was nearly killed by a gas explosion while serving in the armed forces. He was burned over 80% of his body. And the doctors call him a miracle because most people would have died from his injuries. To this day, he suffers with the remnants of that accident. Scars over much of his body. Damaged hearing and eyesight. His hands are so deformed from the explosion that he has difficulty even manipulating simple things like a knife and a fork to eat or a cup to drink water. Water. On top of that, the last few years he's dealt with a couple of falls and some illnesses which have caused him to suffer even more. He's had multiple surgeries on his eyes to try to maintain what little eyesight he has left. And now if that wasn't enough, now he's got this broken hip to deal with and recover from. And man, did I marvel on Friday afternoon watching him work through his rehab. It might have been a little weird for me to sit there for an hour and watch him rehab, but I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was amazing to watch him go through this therapy, which should have been excruciatingly painful for him in his condition. But never once did I hear him complain. <laughs> never once did I hear him cry out in pain or express any painful ideas. Never once did I hear him say, I want to quit. 
In fact, he was in such good spirits that he was even teasing the therapist and teasing Phyllis and I as he was going through his rehab. When he'd get a break, he would pop off something to us and get us laughing. He even stopped for a moment and started asking me about my family. And he knew stuff about my family. Ask specific questions, not just random things. He's a remarkable man. He has always had my admiration and respect, but you know, sometimes we take for granted the people who are in our midst, especially a hero like Ken. And the one thing that has kept Ken moving forward is his faith. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of these terrifying, uncertain moments that he's had to deal with his entire life, he continues to grow closer and closer to Jesus. Folks, suffering was never meant to be part of this world. <laughs> it wasn't God's plan. His plan was perfection. And because of a choice we made, meaning humanity, this place became fallen. But here's what I believe. God can do incredible, unexpected, transformational works in the midst of our suffering. I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning in a different way. I'm going to pray from Scripture again like I did a couple of weeks ago. And this prayer is going to come from the final words of Jesus that he gives to us from the book of Revelation. So if you'll stand with me and bow your heads and close your eyes, I want you to take heart in these words that Jesus says to us. If you would bow your heads with me. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. The one who is victorious will not hurt at all by the second death. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates to the city. Outside the city are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root, the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Father God, let us steadfastly rest on these promises. Let us hold resiliently to these truths. Let us profess these words of hope to the weary and the forsaken. Let us humbly approach the Lamb of God for His grace, which is sufficient. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. You've given us a home. You've given us a heart. You've given us a home.